Welcome to the Truckers and Nerds podcast, where we connect real life truckers with freight tech companies to discuss technological innovations in the trucking industry. The Truckers and Nerds podcast is hosted by Tabena Aro Diobu, CEO and founder of Cloud Trucks. This podcast is brought to you by Cloud Trucks. So welcome to a new episode of the Truckers and Nerds podcast. Uh, today, we are, we're here with Paul Gross, uh, who is the CEO of Remora. Um, Paul, it's, it's, it's really nice to have you uh, on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I'm, Remora is one of the companies I'm really excited about and, and, and I'm excited about what you guys are working on. But uh, I think it would be great for uh, the audience to hear about your company in, in your own words. So uh, can, can you talk a little bit about you know, your background and then uh, uh, your journey to founding Remora? And, and then we can go into a little bit more about the company. I graduated from college in 2020. And while I was a senior, I got really obsessed with this question, why can't we capture carbon emissions from a truck's tailpipes? So I did a whole bunch of deep research and I came across this PhD dissertation online that basically laid out the way that we'd be able to do what's called mobile carbon capture, which is capturing carbon emissions from a semi trucks tailpipes. And I read it all the way through and I thought this was brilliant. So I reached out to the author, um, Christina Reynolds, and she and I really hit it off. She was a scientist at the EPA at the time. Her, her work had been funded by the EPA up until then. And we ended up deciding to start a company together to bring this technology to life. Um, we also brought on board Eric, our other co-founder, who's a diesel mechanic for a decade. And then he actually built a uh, hydrogen fuel cell and battery electric class eight trucks for some of the world's largest automotive companies. So the three of us got together and decided, you know what, let's bring this technology to life. Let's make a device that captures the carbon emissions from a semi truck. And that's how the three of us started Remora. No, that's uh that's that's an amazing story and uh by the way like you know kudos to you i mean uh how many how many people are in college reading papers about uh carbon and then and then taking that that additional step to, to actually reach out to the author of the papers <laughs> well thank you um i was just really curious to be honest and i Felt like the best way to answer some of my questions was just to talk to the author herself. And she's just brilliant. I'm so glad to have met her. And I feel incredibly lucky to be working with her and with Eric to build this company. Uh, that's great. So, so talk, talk to us um, a little bit about uh, Remora then. So what, 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 exactly, what, what exactly does the company do? Remora is a 27 person company in Detroit. Um, we build a device that captures the carbon emissions from a semi truck. So our device, you can picture it like this big box that goes on the back of the tractor, right between the tractor and the trailer. And it attaches to the tractor's tailpipes. And then it captures at least 80% of the tractor's carbon emissions. Um, the driver offloads the carbon dioxide while they refuel at a truck stop. And then we take that carbon dioxide and we sell it to concrete producers or other end users. And we're able to share the revenue from the carbon dioxide back with the owner of the truck. So we can help folks dramatically reduce their carbon emissions and earn this new stream of revenue from the carbon dioxide at the same time. Yeah, you know, that this is um, th this is one of, one of the things that I was really fascinated by is the uh, multifaceted uh, impact of the company. And also it, it, it seems like you've been able to capture, um, you've been able to come up with this idea of, you know, guiding people towards caring more about the environment, but also uh, helping them, helping them make, make more money uh, doing so. So like what, what, what type of dollars are, are we talking about here? Say someone uh, puts in this equipment on their truck and the, uh, and the driver you know, is able to offload the, the carbon. Um, how much, how much money are they, are they making? What's the, what's the rev share? And then what's the, what's the cost of putting that device on? When we sell the carbon dioxide from an average semi-truck, we earn about $22,000 per year. 
And we split that revenue 50, 50 with our customers. So, you know, the average truck, someone would be making about $11,000 a year when they put this device on their truck. Um, we sell the device up front for about $30,000. So that means you break even on the device in about three years. It lasts a lot longer than that. So then it turns into this great revenue stream. And in the future, you know, we're not doing this right now, but in the future, we'd love to offer an option for folks to just put this on their truck for free. And then we can take a little bit more of the revenue from the carbon dioxide on the back end just to finance that and make sure that we are breaking even on our own manufacturing costs, but we can still generate this nice revenue stream for folks who want to decrease their emissions. Got it. Got it. That's that. That's interesting. And, and then um, you, you were talking about the you know, you said that when the driver goes to a truck stop and they're and they're refueling, they can uh, offload the carbon. What is that? What's that process like? How how easy is it to do that? And and how much time does it take? And then what, what what's the machine that they're offloading that to? Is that is that something that's owned by Remora? It is. We install offload tanks to start at our customers' distribution centers. So we recently shared in the Wall Street Journal that we are working with some of the largest trucking companies in the country. We're also working with you know, some of the largest Fortune 500 companies, including a couple of the Fortune 10. So some of those companies are Cargill, Ryder, Werner, ArcBest. And you know, let's take Ryder for an example. We're installing a carbon dioxide offload tank at their distribution center, and they're running round trips, and they offload the carbon dioxide at the end of the day. The way the offload process works is the driver pulls up to this big offload tank, attaches a hose to the device. The device pumps the carbon dioxide out into the offload tank automatically. And then the driver detaches the hose and they're done. And the whole process just takes five minutes. It's like refueling in reverse. The driver doesn't have to do anything fancy with the device. You don't have to take anything off the truck or put anything new on the truck. It's just attach a hose and then detach a hose and you're done. And in the future, we'll be installing these offload tanks at truck stops as well. So, you know, folks can just offload while they're you know, traveling across the country, while they're in many different parts of the country. Um, and we will take care of the rest. We will track that you offloaded the CO2 and then we'll transport it and sell it. And we'll transfer that money uh, that we earn from selling it back to the truck. Got it. Got it. And then, and I imagine one of the, one of the complexities there and one of the reasons you, you, uh, you're starting off with the distribution centers is tracking, you know, which customer offloaded what amount of carbon and how much, how much should they be getting back and things like that. That's right. It's actually not that hard. We have, there's already a kind of electronic handshake that happens between the device and the offload tank when we connect them. So we know who's offloading the carbon dioxide. I think for us, it's more just the logistical complexity of working with uh, truck stops. It's a third party and, you know, it's easier just to start with a partnership with, for example, a rider where we can just install an offload tank on their property and just the two uh, of us can do a partnership and kind of prove out the model before we start to scale to truck stops. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, and, you know, I, I know that in, in the trucking industry, uh, weight, uh, you know, it's, is, is always a, a concern, right? So, so, so I'm sure this is something that you've, you've thought about a lot. So how, how much do, um, do, do the devices weigh and you know how, how does that affect uh, any other any other potential costs for the customer who's putting on that device? so the device is big and heavy it's it's really big it's really heavy especially our first generation device um, the device that we're currently rolling out weighs about five thousand three hundred pounds uh, empty and then about six thousand five hundred pounds fully loaded with carbon dioxide. So that's just really big. And for a lot of folks, that's just not going to make sense, especially if you're weighing out instead of cubing out. Um, you know, like any technology, this device is going to get much lighter and much smaller over time. You know, the computer started out the size of an entire room, and now it's down to a laptop or a smartphone. And we, we're going to see a similar trajectory with our device as well. So, you know, I would expect future generations to be significantly lighter. And, you know, the, the reason that this makes sense for a lot of big fleets is that, you know, they have these climate commitments and they understand that the only other option is to buy incredibly expensive electric trucks where you're talking about 15 to 20,000 pounds of batteries added to the tractor in order to sort of accomplish even just a 
600 or 700 mile range. And that's just impossible. You, you can't take away that much payload capacity. Not to mention, you know, replacing every truck in the fleet, building all new charging stations for electric trucks. So I think a lot of big fleets understand that really mobile carbon capture and retrofitting our device onto their truck is going to be the best solution for them. Um, but it's still heavy and um, it will get lighter over time. But that's one of the trade-offs that folks need to make when they're deciding whether to work on use our technology. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, so I, I think that's actually a perfect uh, segue to just just talking about the uh, trucking industry and its impacts on you know, on the environment and carbon emissions and why this stuff is important. So, so, so I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Yeah. To, I mean, the starting point is we're in this climate crisis, right? We're seeing these crazy droughts, wildfires. I mean, I grew up in San Francisco. Last year, the sky in the middle of the day was dark orange because of ash from the wildfires. Um, you know, I've seen the wildfires get so much worse. Um, you know, one of my close family members had a house burned down in the Bay Area. And that's just something that we didn't see 20 years ago. And that's the, the reason that all this is happening, the reason that um, sea levels are rising, the reason that we're seeing these crazy storms in the Northeast is that we're injecting a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We're kind of putting the planet out of balance. And the, the trucking industry is a big contributor to that. Um, you know, the trucking industry in the U.S. moves 70% of all goods. So almost everything around us has been on a truck at some point. And just class eight trucks alone, the semi trucks, contribute about 340 million metric tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere every year. Um, that's 5% of the entire U.S. carbon footprint, which is just staggering. I mean, th think about all the different things we do to emit uh, carbon dioxide. Semi-trucks alone are a huge chunk of that. Uh, so that's the scale of the problem. And that's, that's why we need to do something about the carbon dioxide emissions, um, you know, they are going to be driving this kind of a negative spiral that we're in, um, that it, we're just going to see the extreme weather events, the droughts, the wildfires just get worse and worse if we don't do anything about it. And so that's why we're building this technology. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's great. And obviously, this is uh, this is really important. So I, I'm curious about what trucking companies were already doing to kind of address this. You alluded to this earlier that there's some regulatory pressure that's coming down. I mean, I know in, uh, in California, for example, I believe in uh, starting January 2022, everyone has to have an engine that's, uh, that was built uh, 2008 or newer. So, so, so I know that there, there's a lot of concern here. Um, so what are, what, what are the, the trucking companies doing uh, doing today to address this? Unfortunately, there's not a lot that they can do to address carbon emissions. The main regulations we've seen so far are focused on pollution and criteria pollutants. And so it's really important to just distinguish between these different buckets of concern. You know, the, the particulate matter and the NOx and SOx, the criteria pollutants that are coming out of these trucks, that's creating pollution. That makes the air quality worse. It hurts people's lungs. It makes people sick. That's a really big problem. And that's something the government has stepped in to fix. That's what the DPF and the SCR on some of the new trucks, that's what, they, that's what those devices are designed to do. It's designed to decrease those emissions. But that's not addressing the carbon dioxide that's coming out of the truck. And carbon dioxide doesn't contribute to pollution. It's, it's not a pollutant. It's odorless. It's, it's clear. But it contributes to climate change. And it's, it's contributing to these extreme weather events that we're seeing all over the world. And so that's why we need to develop a complementary system to the stuff that the government's already requiring to decrease carbon emissions. And that's the goal of the Remora unit. So really, trucking companies before this didn't have many options. I mean, right now, their main options to decrease carbon emissions are, hey, you know, maybe you should drive a little bit more carefully so you're using a little bit less fuel. Um, hey, maybe we should uh, try to decrease you know, deadhead miles. But other than that, there's not a lot else you can do. Um, and that's why we need a device like ours that can retrofit onto these existing trucks and, and actually decrease their carbon emissions. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about the 
you know, you, you, you were talking about the, the uh, driver goes to this distribution center, they offload the carbon into this tank. You know, at some point, I guess the remora team goes over, uh, takes out the carbon from the tank. What what happens from there? I, I think pe- people are, are probably curious to understand, like, what's the... Um, what what are the steps being taken from that point going forward, and and how who exactly is then paying uh, for you know like who who's the who's the other customer right? You were talking about the rev rev share with the company, like who who's actually paying for this? So step one is the driver offloads the carbon dioxide into the offload tank. Once that offload tank fills up, you know, after a couple of weeks, then we come by with a tanker truck and we grab that CO2, put it in the tanker and drive it to an end user. And the kinds of end users we're talking about are concrete producers, greenhouses, wastewater treatment companies, other folks that are using carbon dioxide in their industrial processes. And we just put that our carbon dioxide in their tank and then they pay us for it. Um, the carbon dioxide market is actually massive. It's a $7.7 billion industry worldwide. Um, we see about 230 million metric tons of carbon dioxide used every year in applications like concrete. And we're mostly focused on applications where the carbon dioxide can get sequestered permanently. So a good example is concrete. When the concrete producer uses it, they inject the carbon dioxide into the concrete during the curing process, which makes the concrete stronger. It also makes it cheaper and it sequesters the carbon dioxide permanently, meaning that even if you break up the concrete, even if you do do any number of things to it, the carbon dioxide will never get back out. It will never escape into the atmosphere. So we can be sure that we are not going to contribute to climate change with those emissions. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. So, um, you know, it, it, it looks like you've had, you've had, uh, you know, so, uh, a lot of success in a very short period of time. You know, you've been able to partner with uh, some of the largest companies in the uh, trucking industry. What, what what do you think is driving their decisions uh, to to partner with with Remora? At, um, you know, so, so early into your company's uh, company's life cycle, and it also looks like you're you're, you're going to start deploying this. Uh, next year, which is which is amazing. That's right. We are. We shared in the Wall Street Journal a few weeks back that we're we signed up sixteen multi billion dollar fleets for pilots, including nine of the Fortune five hundred, a couple of the Fortune ten, and then yeah, some of the largest trucking companies in the country. And those pilots are taking place throughout twenty twenty two and into twenty twenty three. And you're right, we're starting our first pilots in Q one of twenty twenty two, so just in a couple months. The reason that these trucking companies have signed up is, first of all, folks just are realizing that we're really living in an emergency right now. I think that's that's actually kind of underrated. People just are feeling freaked out when they see their families' homes burning down and when they see um, you know five feet of water in the street. It just it you realize that we're in this crazy historical moment where things are not happening the way they used to. We're seeing these extreme weather events and and we're just seeing the world change. And I think big companies are slowly waking up to the idea that we need to do something about this right now. Otherwise, it'll be too late. So that's one big factor. I think another big factor is a lot of folks are feeling pressure from customers to take action on climate change. Um, You know, we're seeing incredible activism from a lot of people around the world. And I think big companies are feeling that and realizing if they don't adapt, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be losing customers. Then we see the, the, the stock market, you know, there are a lot of people increasingly only investing in stocks that are, you know, doing good work on sustainability. So I think that's another big driver as is future regulation. We already touched on this a little bit, but the work that government is doing in this space is really critical. Um, and I think folks are really trying to figure out the best way to transition some of these really hard to decarbonize sectors to zero emissions. And those factors together are kind of working to make these big companies jump on board early. And I think they're just feeling a lot of urgency because they've committed to reduce their emissions and now they need to figure out, well, how on earth are they going to do it? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. So, um, I, I'm curious how COVID has, uh, uh, affected, affected your business. If, 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 if it has in any way, we started the company during COVID. In fact, I didn't meet my co-founders in person for months after we started the company. So we just spent lots of time over Zoom. And uh, that was that was a really... I think for, as a result, we are kind of only used to working during COVID. And so we've kind of adapted to some of the challenges that it poses. I think the biggest one is the supply chain delays that we see. It's just so difficult. We're building these big devices that require a lot of raw materials. It's just so difficult to find enough raw materials to get them shipped in a timely manner and stay on track with our manufacturing. I, I think that's the biggest challenge that we've been facing. Um, you know, other than that, honestly, COVID has not impacted our company too much. Our business, you know, doesn't rely on a whole bunch of customers kind of getting together in, inside or in rooms. Um, you know, we're just building a device that goes on trucks outdoors. So it's from that perspective, we haven't really seen too much of an impact other than the supply chain delays. Got it. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, uh, some of the supply chain issues that you're talking about, I mean, that's, that's been, uh, it's been interesting on our end as well. So we started, we we started uh, cloud trucks before the pandemic, uh, but but it was only only a few months before, and uh, we launched our product. Wow. Yeah, we, we we launched our product right in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, it was um, May of 2020. So you know, so some of the stuff we're facing today is uh, it, it's really hard to find trailers. You know, and we we, we just did an episode mm. of, the, of the podcast on this, just talking about the effects um, uh, the, the the effects that the pandemic has had on logistics businesses, and and you know what owner operators are facing and, and kind of what, what we see going forward. So, so, so it's always interesting to hear uh, how it's impacting, um, impacting other folks. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious by the way about uh, own, the owner operator segments, right. And the small, the small fleet segments, obviously you're, you're building this, uh, uh, th- this really huge device, it makes sense to start off with the large fleets that have um, distribution centers and all of those other things that make it easier uh, to to test and deploy and all of that. But uh, I- I'm always curious about how we get these technologies that you know, help the environment, but also uh, could could lead to additional revenue sources for owner operators. How we we can get these devices into their hands. So, is there any plan for Remora to do that in the future? One hundred percent. We want this technology not just to help big companies. We we actually particularly want it to help owner operators. We want it to help small trucking companies. And our plan is to pilot with these big companies who have a lot of resources to kind of help us get this off the ground. And then as soon as possible to start rolling out offload stations at truck stops so that we can then start selling this technology to anyone who wants to decarbonize their truck and make a little bit of extra money. And our plan is to do that as fast as possible. So I, I would look out for that starting in in about a year, maybe in early 2023. And, you know, before then, if folks are interested in getting involved and and getting our technology, they can just go to our website and sign up for updates. And that's where we share the latest and we will share our, our timeline on when we'll be able to start rolling out this technology to owner operators. Um, because that's, that's really a huge goal for us is, this is extra money. We know how much that would matter um, apart from the decarbonization. And so we want to get this into everyone's hands as quickly as possible. Yeah, no, that sounds great. And maybe, uh, maybe, maybe that's a place that uh, cloud trucks can, can help, um, can help partner and support and, and introduce you to, to owner operators who, uh, who, who are, are definitely going to be interested, uh, interested in using this stuff. Um, so uh you know what, what? One of the things that I I really appreciate just listening to you talk about the problem and how you how you read upon read upon it and reached out to the right folks and started the company and how you're actually thinking about uh, you know, 
who the end customer is and, and generating revenue or rev share. It's like, it's like you have this, this uh, well thought out plan and vision that um, is actionable today and can drive impact today. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I was wondering if you, if you have any advice for other founders who are looking to build, you know, climate first companies. Um, Cause I, I think usually or at least in, in some groups, people view this uh, view climate companies as uh, a, a money sink in a sense. But hearing you talk, it's you know, it's like it's like you can help the, <laughs> you can improve the environment, but you can also uh, make some profits doing so. So, so I was wondering if you could just share share any insights that you've had so far. Of course. So I completely agree with what you're saying, which is. Climate, having a climate impact is not kind of opposed to making money. And we've seen this with a whole bunch of solutions. You know, there are many solutions that help you decrease your fuel use, that help you, you know, do more efficient routes. All that is both having a positive impact on the environment and it's also helping you make extra money or save money. So they're just not opposed. And I think the first thing I'd say is any business can be climate first, can be focused on reducing emissions. That's what we've seen with some of our mo- our largest customers, you know, their trucking companies or their um, big consumer facing companies, it, they're not a climate business, but nonetheless, they're having this big impact because of the choice they made to care about this and to invest in these new solutions that are actually going to end up making them money and, and are going to end up helping them a lot. So that's the first thing is any company can, can do this. In terms of founding a climate focused company, I think the biggest thing that I learned from this process is counterintuitively, it's actually helpful to do something harder, to do something more ambitious. And the reason for that is when you're doing something hard and ambitious, people just come out of the woodwork to try to help you. You know, people, professors, like just, I mean, investors, uh, you know, folks who want to join the team, just really amazing, talented people reach out and just want to get involved, just want to help out. And often, you know, I hear things like, I don't normally do this, but, you know, I'm really excited about what you're doing and I'd love to be helpful wherever I can. And that kind of force of excitement and passion about um, this big ambitious goal is so powerful. And I think that is one of the underrated things about doing a hard business is it actually can ironically end up being easier than doing something you know, that's thought to be easy, but actually, you know, not, not a lot of people want to pitch in to help. So that's the biggest piece of advice. I think the other thing I've learned is I just didn't have much background in this before I started it. I was a college student. Um, I thought I wanted to go into politics and the way that I was able to get involved is I just started asking questions and started trying to understand the space myself. And anyone can do that. You know, anyone can track down someone who's written this brilliant dissertation and go call them up and say, you know, I'll just take all of the lame work off of your plate so that you can focus on the thing that you're a world expert in. And, um, you know, you can do that and I'll do the rest of the work and we can start a company together. You know, you don't have to have a PhD. You, you can be just a college student reading other people's work. Um, so I think finding the right co-founders is the other big piece of advice here is, you know, it doesn't have to be you. That's the scientific expert. Um, you can find other people that are excited to start a company alongside you. Yeah. Um, Paul, you make it, you, you make it sound easy and I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by what you're working Thanks. on. So, uh, I think, I think this is a, this, this is a really good place to leave it. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to be to be doing some work together in the future. I'm looking forward to that. And thanks again for having me. 